You know, in terms of technology, we live in an incredibly amazing time in history. Uh, you have tablets, some of you have tablets, smartphones, uh, laptops, where you have a world of discovery right at your fingertips. Just take your thumbs and type some stuff in and stuff pops up. Uh, a world, by the way, for those of you who are probably younger than 30, that was virtually unimaginable when I was growing up. I mean, when I was growing up, a tablet was a pad of paper. If you really wanted to impress, you had a legal pad instead of a regular pad of paper. A smartphone, quote unquote, was one with push buttons instead of a dial. When I was 11 years old, that's when the push button phones were first introduced, 1963. And uh, you thought you were pretty impressive if you had a push button phone. Um, I learned just this week that the word Google, you probably all know this, it's a creative spelling apparently of Google, a term that was coined in the 1930s to refer to an unimaginable number. Uh, 10 to the 100th power is a Google. And so it's totally appropriate that Google would apply to what it does today both in noun and verb form. So it's beyond remarkable. And yet we take it all quite for granted, don't we? We take our smartphones and our tablets and our iPads for granted. Now when you sit down and open your Bible, whether it's paper or electronic, it doesn't matter, uh, a whole world of discovery opens up before you. And actually, I would suggest to you a world well beyond the world of Google. It's the merging of the temporal with the eternal. Think about that. It's the merging of the temporal, people who live in time and space, with the eternal, the one who never had a beginning and will never have an end. It's the merging of the human with <clears throat> the divine <clears throat> when you sit down and read your Bible. It's where God meets with a person who comes looking to hear God actually speak to you. We, we serve and know a talking God, a God who has always spoken. And this is where he speaks today, fundamentally, through his word. And yet we're guilty of taking it for granted, um, dismissing it, giving it scant attention. You know, I would just simply ask each of you who is here this morning, and I'm probably preaching to the choir, the fact that you're here is a really pretty significant sign, but how much time did you spend with God in his word in the past 168 hours since we last met? We dismiss it. We give it scant attention. And so the question that I ask myself sometimes is just as much as we can ooh and ah over doing a Google search or being able to talk to Alexa or whatever it is in your house, do you ever find yourself ooing and aahing at things that you find in here? Does it amaze you? Uh, does it cause you to wonder at times? So what exactly is supposed to be happening when you read your Bible? Um, I mean, is it no different than when you sit down with the Post-Dispatch or the Wall Street Journal or a John Grisham novel? Only maybe for some of you, reading the Wall Street Journal is more informative and reading a John Grisham novel is more entertaining. Or is it supposed to be and does it have the potential to be something very different? Is it just words? Is it simply ink on paper or pixels on a screen? Or is there, is there some other element that's involved when you open your Bible? some element that makes it actually a supernatural experience. This morning in the second message in a, our short five-week series of messages here at the beginning of the year, why you need to be in God's Word in 2019, we began last year, why you need to be with the gathered church every week in 2018, and I know some of you made some commitments along those lines. This year, it's why you need to be in God's Word in 2019. This is the second message. We're going to consider the difference between a natural reading of the Bible and a supernatural reading of Scripture. What the difference is between those two. And what you can expect to happen 
if you humbly come to this book and open it expecting to hear from God, expecting to meet God, expecting to see Christ in its pages. Now, I had originally planned on using Hebrews 4.12 as the key verse for this morning. Um, I think we have, do we have that verse up on the screen? The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's a great verse, powerful verse. The word of God is living, it's active, it's piercing, it's discerning. John Grisham novels don't do that. The Wall Street Journal doesn't have that power. So it would have been a great verse to use. Or 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God, all of it, and is profitable, extremely beneficial for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God, the woman of God, may be equipped for every good work. Great verse. There's other verses that we could have used for this kind of a message. But instead, I decided to use a piece of narrative from Luke's gospel. It's about an account that Jesus, an encounter that Jesus has with two disciples that we'll meet in just a minute. Two disciples that Jesus spent time with came near came near to them, spent time with them, walked with them, talked with them, conversed with them, and then explained to them and interpreted to them the scriptures concerning himself. And I want to suggest to you this morning that what happened to them physically is what should happen for you spiritually whenever you open this book to meet with Jesus. I'm suggesting to you this morning that when Jesus met with these two men to explain to them what had just happened in the last couple of days and as a result of that what had happened in the last couple of millennia leading up to those couple of days I want to suggest to you this morning that what they experienced is what you need to experience every day and potentially this will serve as a motivation for you to do this more than you're currently doing it. You mean I actually can listen to God speaking to me this week? I can actually hear a word from him. He actually wants to meet with me. And this is the way he chooses to do it, fundamentally. You see, this is what sets the Bible apart from John Grisham, or Ernest Hemingway, or William Shakespeare, or J.K. Rowling, or whatever authors, or even this, the quote-unquote sacred texts of the world, religions. This is what sets the Bible apart from the Quran of Islam or the Vedas of Hinduism or the Talmud of Judaism or any other so-called sacred text. The Bible's different, friends. The Bible stands all by itself in this regard. So the scripture for this morning, Luke chapter 24, it's an extended passage I would ask as you're able to please stand to honor the reading of God's word. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, They came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels 
who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us? while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. Then dropping down, then he said to them, this is when he's meeting with the 11, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then, He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So, Lord God, we would pray that you would open our minds, Spirit of God. Open our minds to see and to understand and to believe the things that we find in this great book that you have given to us. We give you thanks and praise for your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's be seated. So from this narrative, I want to suggest to you this morning, there are essentially three things that you want to happen pretty much simultaneously and all sort of in conjunction with each other when you open your Bible and read your Bible. Um, The three things that actually happened to these two disciples as they walked along the road and met up with Jesus. These are things that God graciously will grant to you if you humbly approach him in his word, desiring to hear him speak to you, to give you a word from his word for your life. First of all, God will grant you to see with your eyes. He will grant you to see with your eyes, whereas others will read the Bible and fail to see even the most basic things in the Bible. There are people who read this book and they cannot see. Their eyes cannot see. They do not comprehend the words that they are reading. And most importantly, they will fail to see Jesus in this book for who he really is. Now, the two disciples that were walking along the road were not any of the 11. We meet up with the 11 in the, at the end of this chapter. The two, these were two others. We know that one of them was named Cleopas. We're given his name in verse 18. He was possibly the one that John refers to in his gospel, John 19, as Clopas, potentially the same as Clopas, who was husband to Mary's sister. And so conjecture possibly would be maybe it's Cleopas and some other man, or maybe it's Cleopas and his wife walking along the road as two disciples heading back to Emmaus. That's conjecture, unimportant, other than the fact that I would encourage you to study the Bible and try to find out answers to questions. Be inquisitive. Wonder, is this person possibly the same as this person? Hold the Bible up to itself and learn. Now, the first thing I don't want for us to miss in this account is in verse 15. We'll get to the fact that they needed eyes to see, but the first thing I want you to to not miss is in verse 15 where it says, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. People, that is such a a wonderful statement. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. The risen incarnate Son of God became that personal 
I mean, how much more personal can God get than this? I mean, first, he knows that these two people are dejected, they're sad, they're disillusioned, they're confused. Then he, he takes the initiative to draw near to them and then to spend time with them walking along this road between Jerusalem and Emmaus. Your understanding of Christ needs to have these kinds of images to inform your understanding of who Jesus is, of who your Savior is. He is not distant. He's very personal. He comes very near. He walks with and he talks with those who desire to hear from him and to meet with him. You need to see a Savior who is this personal. He knows your condition. He knows the path you're walking. He knows the struggles along the roadway. He knows the experiences of your life. He knows the things that are inside your hearts. He knows the source of your confusion. He knows the things that you're trying to get answers to. He knows you through and through. And that's why you want to meet with him every day, every day, and hear him speak. I love the fact that Luke emphasized this by saying Jesus himself drew near. In other words, he didn't send an angel. Isn't that interesting? He sent angels to the tomb. But with these two disciples, one whose name we don't even know, Jesus himself drew near to them and spent time with them. Psalm 139 is one of my favorite psalms. Uh, In it, David says, for you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, you discern, my, you discern my going out and my lying down, you're familiar with all my ways. That's, that's your Lord. That's the one who drew near to these two disciples. And so the application is when the Lord draws near to you, when you sit down to meet with him in his word, when you do this tomorrow, Let's just, let's just make it, when you, tomorrow morning you sit down and have your devotions or whatever time of the day you sit down and meet with God in his word. He knows your thoughts. He knows your path. He knows your concerns. He knows your questions. He knows the things that you don't know that are going to happen the rest of the day. He knows everything that needs to be known by a loving, caring, compassionate tender, all-knowing Savior and Lord. And I would add to this that I believe today for us the primary way that you draw near to God, I believe the secondary way is prayer. I believe the primary way you draw near to God is through his word because it is his word that will lead you to prayer. It is his word that will inform your prayers, that will educate your prayers that will motivate and stir your prayers. I believe prayer is the secondary way that you draw near to God. Primarily, it's right here, because this is where he meets with you. This is where he reveals himself to you. And then you read in verse 16, something interesting. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Think about it, he was right there with them. He was right there with them. It'd be like, Will coming into the office, and I'm in my office, and he doesn't recognize me. You say, what's going on? Why, why? Well, all I can come up with is that God prevented them from recognizing him until some of their uncertainty could be cleared up. And I think sometimes that happens with us. Sometimes I believe the Spirit of God settles me in here and says, Let's just, let me just teach you for a bit. And then you'll, you're clear, there'll, there'll be some clarity. You don't see everything clearly just yet. It'll come. The veil will be taken off your eyes, but right now, I just need to show you some stuff. That, that'd be my guess as to what's going on here. There are other occasions when the Lord kept certain things hidden from the disciples for his own purposes. And Jesus even said, in terms of the people of the world, he said, I thank you, Father. When he he taught in parables, he said, I thank you, Father, that you have kept these things hidden from the wise of this world, from those who have all kinds of knowledge. You've kept these things hidden from them, but you've revealed them to children. I'm so glad that that's the kind of God that we have. 
And then through having this conversation with these two people, Cleopas and friend or spouse, whoever it is, spending time with them, the moment finally comes when the veil is lifted from their eyes. Verse 31, their eyes were opened and they recognized. That was right after he broke bread with them. Spends, spends an extended amount of time with them. Then they, they persuade him to stay and have dinner. They have dinner. He breaks bread, and then their eyes are open, and they recognize who this is that's been talking with them for, for quite a while. And friends, this is what needs to happen, and this is what God's Spirit will graciously allow to happen for you when you draw near to God in his word. You want for your prayer to be Psalm 119, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things in your law. And Lord, especially open my eyes that I may behold Christ. Open my eyes that I may see Jesus in Genesis, that I may see Jesus in the Psalms, in Isaiah, in Deuteronomy, in Leviticus. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. See, that's what Satan wants to keep a person from seeing. That, right there, that is what Satan wants to keep a person from seeing when they open this book. The light of the gospel of the glory of... Satan doesn't care if you see all kinds of other things. I've shared with you before that my dad used to read the Bible. He'd have sporadic bouts with the Bible, I will call them. Um, And he would see politics in here. He would see... He would see all kinds of things, but he just couldn't seem to see Jesus for who he really is. And to my knowledge, he never did. You don't want that to be true for you. And so every day when you open the Bible, pray that, Lord, open my eyes that I may see Christ. That I may behold the glory of the gospel of Christ. John Piper writes these words, Satan is not opposed to all Bible reading. Bible reading that only collects facts or relieves the guilty conscience or gathers doctrinal arguments or titillates aesthetic literary tastes or feeds historical curiosities. Now, this kind of Bible reading, Satan is perfectly happy to leave alone. He's already won the battle. But reading that aims to see the supreme worth and beauty of God, reading that aims to be satisfied with all that God is for us in Christ, reading that seeks to taste and see that the Lord is good. This reading, Satan will oppose with all his might, and his might is supernatural. Therefore, any reading that hopes to overcome his blinding power will be a supernatural reading. Now, related to the first element, supernatural element, I want to suggest to you is the second, and that is you want for God to grant you to understand with your mind. And obviously, the two go together. Eyes to see and a mind to understand. You're processing thoughts. You're analyzing. You're you're sorting stuff out in your head. You're taking the mind that God has given you and using it to try to figure these things out, and you're saying, Lord, with this With my mind as it is, I can't figure this. I need supernatural help. Because this isn't the Wall Street Journal. This isn't John Grisham. This isn't J.K. Rowling. This is your word. I need you to give me understanding. It says, after listening to the two disciples, it says that Jesus then began to teach them. Verse 27 Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he began with Moses. Fundamentally, that's the Pentateuch in your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's where Jesus started. And 
and he starts to help them connect all the dots. That's what he's doing. He's going back into the Old Testament scriptures. He says, let me show you, let me show you Genesis 3, for example. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. And these two disciples say, yeah, we've read the Genesis account many times. What are you saying? And he explains it to them and he interprets it for them. Later on in, the, later on in their walk, the, he takes them to Isaiah 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the two disciples say, yeah, we've read that passage many times. And Jesus says, well, let me explain it to you. Micah 5, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Isaiah 53, you're familiar with Isaiah 53. I won't take the time to read the whole passage. The suffering servant passage. And by the way, that's the passage that in Acts chapter 8, Philip comes alongside the official from Ethiopia, and the official from Ethiopia is sitting in his chariot reading Acts chapter 8. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, no, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? Well, that's what Jesus was doing with those two disciples. He was explaining Isaiah 53 for them. And by the way, I would suggest to you from the, from the Philip Ethiopian passage in Acts chapter 8, that job is now given to us. That privilege is now given to us to come alongside someone like Jesus did with, with Cleopas and his friend and explain to them the scriptures. How can they understand unless someone who knows them comes alongside them and says, do you understand what it is that you're reading? Would you like to talk about it? Let me explain it for you. And also the Psalms, I think, we have, I think I threw a couple of Psalms up there. Um, he took them, he's going to tell the disciples later on, he took them to the Psalms. Psalm 2, it's just a great, great passage. In it, it says, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Amazing. And he explains to the two disciples who that is. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. And Jesus says, does this sound at all familiar to what you just observed a couple of days ago? They pierced my hands and my feet. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. And Jesus says, isn't that what they did with Jesus of Nazareth's clothes? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. How long did this tutorial take, do you think? I get the impression that for as long as they walked, Jesus talked. And Luke tells us that the village of Emmaus, which is where they were going from Jerusalem to Emmaus, was seven miles. Today, apparently, archaeologists say they don't know the exact site of Emmaus, but the Jew first century Jewish historian Josephus said that Emmaus was 30 stadia, or three and a half miles from Jerusalem, which would mean that potentially Luke here is talking about the round trip. Three and a half miles to Emmaus, three and a half miles back, it's a seven-mile walk, potentially. Regardless, it gives you an idea of the length of the conversation. How, how, how long is a conversation when you walk three, three or four or five or six or seven miles? Depends on how fast, how fast you walk. But I picture Jesus and these two people walking casually, leisurely, stopping. Wait a minute. 
you're saying that Genesis 3, and then they would walk some more, and then he takes them over to Leviticus. Says, oh, wait a minute, you're saying... Friends, I really truly believe that Jesus probably spent two or three hours minimum with these two people. Now, my question is this. Do you rush through the time that you spend with God in his word? Do you feel that if you spend five minutes, maybe ten, that'll, that'll do you for the day? Might do you for a couple of days. Or do you ever treat yourself to just simply walking with Jesus in his word and letting him spend time with you, unhurried time, where you ask him questions and he gives you answers and he takes you from this passage of scripture over to this passage of scripture, then back over here and you say, I had never seen that before. See, I want to suggest to you that your devotions should be an opportunity for the Spirit of Christ to help you connect the dots so that you can see Christ more clearly and love him more dearly, follow him more nearly, to use an old song. They will later say to each other, these two, after Jesus leaves them, verse 32, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? That's a great statement. Did not our heart, does your heart ever burn when the Lord opens to you the scriptures? I mean, imagine the Lord doing that with you. Leisurely taking time, think about this, let's just think about this week. Imagine the Lord taking the time out of his busy schedule as the Lord of the universe to draw near to you, to walk with you, maybe for a couple hours, serve as your Bible interpreter for the purpose of giving you greater understanding that you desperately need. Imagine that happening. But wait a minute. That's what's supposed to happen every time you read your Bible. The Spirit of Christ opens to you the scriptures and gives you understanding. Later, Jesus is with the eleven and he says the same thing as he had said to the two. Verse 44. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. By the way, let me give you another application. This is why you need to be reading your Old Testaments, not just the New. You are depriving the Holy Spirit of two-thirds, better than two-thirds of this book when you say, I really only need the New Testament. No, you do not just need the New Testament. The New Testament interprets the Old. The New Testament explains the Old. But allow the Spirit of Christ to take you into the old and and cause you to marvel. It's like taking all of Genesis to Malachi away from the Lord to teach you and give you understanding. Now, very briefly, I just want to throw up, I think it's the next slide. I think those are the two main reasons why people fail to see and fail to understand when they read the Bible. We've already seen Satan blinds the eyes. The second is sin hardens the heart. Satan will blind the eyes and sin hardens the heart. And and I would just, again, speaking to many of you as my brothers and sisters in Christ, understand that your sin, when you enter into a season of sin, when you're, when you're walking in sin, it will harden your, it will, it will crust over your heart to the things of God that the Spirit of God wants to reveal to you. That's why you want to walk in holiness and not in darkness. Scott's thing this morning about not walking in darkness but walking in the light. Um, let me show you a classic example in the New Testament how sin hardens the heart and prevents a person from seeing and understanding. You see, it in the, you see it in the lives of the scribes and Pharisees. 
Do you, all, do you all know who the scribes and Pharisees were in the first century? They were the Bible experts. They knew the Bible inside. They knew the Bible better than anybody else in society knew the Bible. I mean, they were the Bible school teachers and the seminary professors of their day. They had memorized lots of scripture. I mean, if they had been on jeopardy, they would have been salivating if one of the categories was Moses and the law or prophets major and minor. Said, ah, yes. When Jenny and I, when I was in seminary, and Jenny and I lived in the Twin Cities, we went to an evangelical free church, and uh, we worked with middle school students. It was really fun. We really enjoyed those years. And in the E-Free, I don't know if they still do it, but in the E-Free, they had quiz teams. And so you, you have a middle school quiz team and a high school quiz team. We worked with the middle school quiz team, and every year, the, the E-Free would announce that the book for this year that you will be quizzed on is... Galatians. One year it was Romans. And they were responsible to know anything at all that was in that entire book. And so my job was to essentially write up every imaginable question I could possibly think of from, say, the book of Romans. Hundreds and hundreds of questions. And they memorized dozens of dozens and dozens of verses. There was this one girl, I can't remember her name now, but boy, she memorized vast amounts of scripture just so that she could be the first one to jump up off the electric pad and make the light come on and she got to give the answer and she would get the points and we actually had a championship team we had one of the best teams in in all of the twin cities um, you would have wanted a scribe or a pharisee to be on your quiz team or their kids um, <laughs> You would, have, you would have conquered everybody else. But Jesus said to their faces, have you not read? Have you not read this in the law? Have you not read this in the... Don't you understand what Isaiah was saying here? And I just have to believe that their blood would have boiled being challenged by this rabbi regarding their knowledge and understanding of the scripture. How dare you question our scriptural literacy? And Jesus would have replied, well, apparently it doesn't do you any good. You know the Bible through and through, but you don't know me. You don't recognize me. You don't see me. You don't understand how, how Isaiah was talking about me. When I was in college, I was a religion major for my last two years. I changed majors. And um, I had two of my three religion professors knew the scriptures. They did not know Christ. Um, you see, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, it was their pride and their unbelief and their greed for power and their greed for money and their love of praise. They loved their status in society. They loved being experts in the law. They loved intellectualism. They loved the place of honor at feasts. They loved the best seats in the synagogue. They loved recognition. Bottom line, they loved the world more than they loved God and they loved self-glory more than God's glory. And that will keep you from understanding the scriptures. Thirdly, see with your eyes. You need to understand with your mind. And then those two lead to believing with your heart. Believing, really, really believing in your heart. Go back to what Jesus first said to these two disciples after they had expressed to him their confusion. Verse 25, Jesus, Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. I think that needs to be heard coming from Jesus' lips, not with a tone of anger, but with a tone of disappointment. I, I, think, I think he was saddened. Um, there's definitely a bit of rebuke in his words, and we're going to see some more rebuke with the 11 later on. Um, but it's re it is a rebuke stemming from disappointment. 
and a plea for them to have faith in God and what God has said through Moses and the prophets and the Psalms about himself. And Jesus calls them, oh, foolish ones. It's the foolishness of having a heart of unbelief. It's the foolishness of unbelief. It's a heart that is not discerning what God is saying in his word. It's a failure to believe the prophets. You see, what you ultimately want to happen when you read the Bible, when you sit down with your Bible and open it, what you ultimately want to happen is a supernatural work of God that brings about eyes to see, a mind to understand, and a heart that believes and increases in faith because you've been in his word so that your faith tomorrow is just a little bit stronger and clearer than it is today because you met with God here. Because your man's core problem is not some surface sin. Man's core problem is unbelief. Everything else stems from unbelief. I mean, you go through your Bible, you start with the Old Testament, you go through the history of the Israelites, it was unbelief. They didn't believe. They didn't believe what Moses said. They didn't believe what God said he would do. They didn't believe that they didn't need an earthly king, that God could be their king. They didn't believe. And it got them into all kinds of troubles. Adam and Eve didn't believe God. Then you go into the New Testament, the Gospels and letters, you find case after case, example after example of where not believing God, not believing that he is who he says he is, not believing that he would do what he said he would do, not believing what he says about sin and judgment and heaven and hell, not believing that Jesus was who he claimed to be, not believing the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that on the third day he was raised from the dead according to the script, not believing that. Not believing that the day will come when you will give an account of yourself to God. It's unbelief through and through, over and over again. That's why Jesus rebukes them. It's not because he's disgusted with them, it's because he's disappointed and concerned about their belief, their faith. And that would be the same for you. You see it again uh, with the 11. In Mark 16, it says, Afterward, he appeared to the eleven. As they were reclining at table, he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of hearts, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. That's our greatest problem. And so when you open your Bible this week and read it, say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. I need eyes to see, I need a mind to understand, I need a heart that trusts and believes. Now, what will you do with all of this that I've given you today? That's really up to you, isn't it? What will you do with it? It's not too late to grab one of these off the information center it's not too late. This is, what I've, this is what I use. Five-day Bible reading program with the assumption that you'll need a couple days to catch up. That's okay. Or the Read Scripture app. Read Scripture. Type it in and pull it up as an app on your phone. It'll walk you through the Bible very creatively, very beautifully. It's not too late. Don't feel like, well, Gary, this is already January 13th. You know, yesterday was actually the day when people give up on their resolutions. I don't know who's researched that, but apparently 11 or 12 days in is as far as most people get. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. And don't feel like, no, that means I've got to go back and make up January 1st through 12th. No, just start with January 13th. Just start with January 13th. You might have some other days that you can go back and, Bring yourself up to speed. I just really, really, again, I've said this before, I've just got 
hard to believe, I've only got five messages left here in this church. And I just want you to be people of the book. Because by being people of the book, you will be people who love Christ. This is where you meet him. This is where you behold him. This is where you allow him to talk to you, to speak to your life situation, to comfort you and to correct you and to encourage you and to challenge you and to make promises to you and give you a big, bold, beautiful picture of what this life is all about and how meaningless it is without him. That's my heart's desire for all of you and for your children. Parents, you want your kids to love the Bible so that through that they will love Christ. Please do something. Do something this week as you respond to the Lord. And now for those of us who know Christ, it's our privilege to share in the Lord's table it says on the night when Jesus was betrayed. So think about that. This, this, was, this was just a few days prior to crucifixion, resurrection, ascend, or re- resurrection, meeting with these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. What we observe when we take the bread and the cup, that, that's when it happened just a few days before the risen Jesus, the risen Christ, met with these two people on the road to Emmaus. It all happened in history. This isn't myth. This actually happened. And because it happened, and because we just sang earlier this morning, he's alive, that's why we take the bread and the cup. Because it says on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, you are proclaiming my death until I come again. Thank you, Lord. We humbly bow before you. We confess that we would be so, so lost without you. We confess that we need to hear from you. We thank you that you have revealed yourself, your mind and your heart and your will and your purposes. You have not left us to speculate, to guess. No, you have given it to us so clearly and beautifully and wonderfully. You preserved it for us in your word. Oh, Lord, give us a love for your word that through it our love for you would only increase. Thank you, Jesus, that you draw near to those who humbly seek you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I pray for my brothers and sisters here. I pray that this could be a week where we draw near to you, walk with you, listen to you, seek you, and find you conversing with us and showing us things, interpreting the scriptures to us, Spirit of God, revealing Christ to us, causing things to happen in the core of our being that change us from the inside out. And now, risen Christ, we worship you. We praise you for the simplicity of the bread and the profound nature of the cup. We give you all of our praise, and we will remember you until the day we die or the the day that you return. We pray in Christ's name. God's people agreed by saying,
taught me with darkness you have filled me with 